thousand steps a day. Obsessed with fitness? She spends 11 to 13 hours jogging every day in circles around her coffee table. The equivalent of 50 miles a day. Take a bathroom break. You wish you didn't have to do that, right? You'd rather have a catheter. Then he has had 15 procedures to look like a Korean pop star. Like my whole face is numb, but I love it. It's such a great feeling. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. You've never had anybody working harder to bring you to the threshold of change than right now. that exercise is good for us, right? It helps us regulate weight, fight disease, keeps our heart and mind sharp. But how much is too much? My guest Liz loves her Fitbit and counts her steps daily. So you're thinking good, right? But what if I told you that she spends 11 to 13 hours jogging every day in circles around her coffee table? And she does this until she gets 100,000 steps a day. Now that's the equivalent of 50 miles every single day. I got tired reading it. <laughs> now her mom, Karen, worries that her daughter's step obsession will never end and could ruin her marriage as well as her body. Take a look. I set my alarm between 3.30 and 5 a.m. I am obsessed with taking 100,000 steps a day. I kind of let myself down this week. One day I walked 35,000 and it nearly killed me. <laughs> so when I asked her and she says, I think I did 100,000 today. It's like, Liz, why? You don't have time to do anything else. I usually jog about three and a half hours before I take a break. When it's time for my first break, I usually eat yogurt and blueberries. I just mix it in and I jog for about another two and a half, three hours and I eat my second breakfast. And then I jog about another three hours when I eat my lunch. I absolutely wish I just had a catheter so I didn't have to stop jogging. Every seven and a half minutes, I change direction. If Liz got pneumonia, she would still jog around the coffee table. I know I've seen her fall into the coffee table, you know, like trip herself and hurt her leg, and she still continues to jog. Jogging has consumed my life. Well, Liz's extreme step routine means that she burns four to 5,000 calories a day, which makes her think about her other obsession, which is food. My brain is a tangle of an obsession of eating and food and calories. That's literally all I think about. Liz abuses food. When she fixes a meal, she weighs the portions. I restrict my food during the day. I measure out a third of a cup and then I only eat a half of that of the cottage cheese. Yeah, I stick to about 1,900 to 2,100 calories a day and I try to burn a quart or 5,000. The hardest part about restricting my calories is I'm addicted to sweet foods. She has me buy her red velvet cakes. By the end of the night, I like to reward myself with a slice of red velvet cake. On a good day, I'll do two slices. Then after I eat my red velvet cake, I'll let myself get my cereal. Has to be exact. By the time the night's over, I've eaten four or five cups of Lucky Charms. She likes pumpkin pie, she likes cinnamon rolls, but then she's always got to compensate with the steps. Take some cake and keep walking. It's an endless cycle. Sitting here in this interview has given me anxiety and making me wonder how many steps I'm missing and how many calories are going straight to my thighs. Okay, glad to meet you. Thank you. Are you anxious sitting here because you'd rather be yes. <laughs> walking? Yes. And did you did you walk and jog yesterday? Yes. How many steps? About 62,000. About 62,000. So what is going through your mind as you sit here right now? I just have a lot of anxiety. I feel like I'm on the verge of a panic attack because I know that the calories that I ate this morning are just going straight to my thighs and stomach. How long has this been going on? Uh, this has been going on severely for about two years. She's always been obsessed with food, but the jogging um, 
when I got her the Fitbit, that's when it really got severe. And, and you don't blame this on Fitbit, because I mean, that's a, that's a good tool, and oh, people, if they use it properly, it's a great yeah, thing. Yeah, I have one, but yeah. I don't sit there all day yeah, and of course. look at it. So this has been going on about two years, so let's look at your routine. Uh, I want to be sure I have this right. So you get up at 3.30 in the morning, because you got a lot to do. And you jog, and you do this till like 7 a.m., mm -hmm. and then you feed the dogs. Yes. And then you're back at it. At 9.30, you have your first breakfast, which is like yogurt and, and fruit, and you jog while you're eating it. Mm -hmm. And you do this till 11.30 when you have your second breakfast. Yes. And that's usually an English muffin. Uh, then you take a bathroom break. You wish you didn't have to do that, right? I you wish said you'd I did rather it. have a catheter or... <laughs> Yeah. You, you could wear the pins or something. <laughs> Back at it at 11.40, you jog till 1.30, and then you have, you, you slice and refrigerate an apple and then jog. Sometimes you ask her to slice the apple up. If I'm at her. Uh, then for, at 3 p.m., you have lunch, cottage cheese and apple while jogging. Mm -hmm. at 4 p.m., you take a three-minute break for a fruit snack and then back at it. Yes. Three minutes. At the most. <laughs> Then from 4.30 to 5, you stop jogging, depending on the calories burned, when your husband gets home. And then you have dinner, which is a low-calorie grilled cheese. Mm -hmm. Okay, then 5.20, you take your meds, change in your pajamas, feed the dogs. At 5.30, you, what, what do you take then and why? My doctor prescribed me um, Suboxone for a pain medication for my fibromyalgia, and I'd really like to get off of it. So... I've read on my fibromyalgia groups that a lot of people had success taking Kratom to help them get off opioids and help them get off other prescription painkillers. And then you eat uh, red velvet cake. Yes. Then 5.30 to 6, you watch television with your husband. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then at 6 p.m., you eat pumpkin pie or cereal and go or to bed. Cereal. Yeah. What time do you go to bed? About 6.30, sometimes 7. Okay, and then you're back up at 3.30 in the morning. Yeah. What do you think about while you're jogging? Just anything to zone out and not focus on what I'm doing because I'm in so much pain from the jogging. I just try to do anything I can to take my mind off of it. But you're jogging because of the pain. Yeah, that's how it started. But the jogging is causing pain. Yes. Doesn't make much sense, does it? It'd be like if you slammed your hand in the car door and it hurt. So to fix that, you would slam your hand in the car door some more. Never thought of it like that. Well, you're cured. <laughs> I wish. How does Liz's husband feel about a wife who won't grocery shop, leave the house, and constantly walks around a coffee table. We'll be right back. When Liz comes over to my house, I enable her by going out and buying the foods I know she shouldn't have. She wanted a Marie's Calendar's pumpkin pie. I searched around until I found them. And later... My ultimate goal is to look like Jimin, my idol from BTS. I've spent about $150,000 to perfect my image. Tomorrow. My 10-year-old son is very violent. I will kill you. I will murder you. He ripped that out of the banister on the stairs. You say that he really seems to have superhuman strength. I've never seen a little child overpower a grown adult. Do you have any doubt that he is going to seriously injure or kill someone in your family? Don't be me or his siblings. I will choke you till you die. That's tomorrow, then on Monday. Every day I was paddled or beaten. Inside a religious reform school. You weren't allowed to speak for 30 weeks. I was on sentence restriction. That's Monday. You can hear it very, very Ever since I started jogging, I just don't want to leave the house. I try not to get the mail, I try not to get the groceries, I try not to go to doctor's appointments. If I'm around people, they're going to ask me what I've been doing, and I don't have an answer for them other than I just jog around the coffee table in my living room. And everybody's going to think I'm crazy if I tell them that. 
Well, Liz has spent the last two years literally jogging her life away. And when I mean jogging her life away, we just looked at what she does. She gets up at 3 a.m. and she virtually jogs all but about 30 to 45 minutes until she goes to bed very early so she can get up the next day. And she's doing this running around a tiny coffee table in her room. And we're talking about the equivalent of almost two marathons a day. Liz was a different person before the Fitbit. Now, all it is is constant walking. As a mother, her obsession with jogging hurts because I see it's what it's doing to her, her puppies, her husband, but I let her do it because I don't want her angry with me. When Liz comes over to my house, I enable her by going out and buying the foods I know she shouldn't have. She wanted a Marie's Calendar's pumpkin pie. I searched around until I found one. <laughs> she writes me a list of food to get her. And then when it's lunchtime, I says, Mom, can you cut me up an apple? Because she won't stop jogging. My mom's house has a central kitchen area that I can jog around. It's like, why can't she take the time to talk to her mother, do you have to walk the whole time? I want my old daughter back because we used to have so much fun. She would come down, we'd walk on the beach, look for seashells. We always have had a good rapport talking to each other. And I just don't feel like we have that anymore. It, it's like she's become a stranger instead of my daughter. Liz's husband, Joe, is joining us on the phone. Joe, thanks for calling in. How are you doing? Hi, Dr. Phil. Thank you very much for everything you're doing. Well, tell me what your take on all this is. I, I listened to what Karen was saying about enabling her by buying her all the food that she wants. But I personally have a different take on it. I, I get her the food that she wants because um, she started all this because of the pain. But it also morphs into the eating disorder, the calories. Liz has got a beautiful body. She's beautiful, athletic, and she has wasted away to nothing. Joining us via Skype is Liz's sister, Rebecca, who originally wrote to me uh, for help. Rebecca, you actually are concerned that there has been some neurological impact here from some of the things that she's been through, correct? Yeah, possibly. Why do you think that? She's had numerous concussions. I'm not exactly sure how many. This was from what? Some of them may have been accidents. I, maybe one or two were from different guys she dated. I'm not 100% sure, but she needs help. Well, I think you're really suffering with this. I don't think this is something that you do for attention. I don't think it's something that you do because it gives you some kind of um, sick payoff in a way that you are avoiding your marriage or avoiding something that you're actually kind of symbolically running away from your life. Uh, I don't think it's that direct, but uh, I've thought about this a lot. I've been doing this a long time, mm -hmm. and I've actually created an entire schematic of what I think is going on with you here. It's not very pretty because I don't have very good handwriting, but I, I'm going to talk to you about this uh, because I don't think this is a puzzle at all. What was ever done about that? Nothing. Never thought of it like that. That makes sense. And later... Yeah, I'm not losing my who I am. I'm still the same person underneath. Well, you... No, you're not. You're looking at me as if I'm crazy. <laughs> I didn't say that, but... <laughs> Fill in the blanks and my true crime series, Mystery and Murder, Analysis by Dr. Phil, are available now. On Fill in the Blanks, I go into the lives of celebrities like Oprah, Dax Shepard, the Jonas Brothers, Steve Harvey, and in-depth with technology, health, and science, social issues. With my true crime podcast, I look at cases with bizarre circumstances. Download all of our latest podcasts for free, and don't forget to subscribe and rate the shows on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher or your favorite podcast app. Liz, uh, I've got to tell you, and, and for 
people to kind of follow along. This is how my mind works, which is not always linear. It's in a lot of different ways. But I, I started this whole thing with early trauma. Early in your life, I'm sorry to say that you experienced molestation yes. in your life. I'm very sorry that that happened to you. And when it did happen, what was done about that to help you deal with that and Nothing. handle I didn't, that? I didn't tell anybody till I was 16. Right. And so what happened then? My mom showed some concern, but my father didn't believe me. Uh huh. So nothing really happened. This was earlier in your life, and then later, um, you were actually the victim of sexual assault. Yes. What happened to deal with that? Again, I, it was about the same age that I told, finally told yeah. my parents. This was 16, 17, right, when mm -hmm. this happened? What, what happened with that? What did people do about that? I mean, it came up in therapy, but I, I was kind of resistant to talking about it at the time because I felt like I'd gotten over it. I had stuffed it down so much. Then you got into a relationship that was unkind. In fact, it was abusive. Very. What was ever done about that? Nothing. Whenever you've been through these three major life events, it affects your self-esteem. It affects the way you perceive yourself. There's no question in my mind that you're very likely suffering from PTSD. And if you get in a situation where there are triggers that remind you of any of those situations you've been through, and from the age of 12 to 30, there's a record of you taking very high risk behaviors, behaving recklessly in your life, which tells me that this is a time when you really didn't value yourself. And as a result of these three things, in early trauma, it leaves you at a very low emotional age in terms of your ability to accommodate to and problem solve things emotionally. You're clearly being enabled. Mm -hmm. Your mother is enabling you. Your husband is enabling you because people are trying to love you and help you, but it goes beyond that. And if something happens to disrupt, you respond with rage. And so I, I come over here and I look at your attempts to cope. And we see bulimia and anorexia. And you say that that was very prominent at one point in your life. Mm -hmm. That's never ended. You're just white knuckling that. You've just stopped the food manipulation and started excessive exercising. And I, I look at the failed management. Uh, you've been on the wrong meds. You've been misdiagnosed. You walk to the point that you build up so much lactic acid that you're guaranteed to have fibromyalgia. You're guaranteed to have joint pain. You're guaranteed to have everything that you say you're walking to get away from. And then you've got people misdiagnosing you, and you have never had any real treatment. So I don't ask myself why you're in this situation. I ask myself, why not? I mean, when I look at it schematically, this is not a puzzle. Never thought of it like that, but that makes sense. Well, look, I reached out to a really good friend of mine, Dr. Dina Mannion, and she has graciously offered to first get us to a baseline by doing a medical detox on you. They have a wonderful treatment center called Revive, which will help you with this Suboxone and the other prescription meds. And after that, uh, you're welcome at a program that they have called Awakenings, which is a neuroscience-based dual diagnosis treatment program, which deals with a wide variety of mental health and addictive disorders. And they really have a sophisticated and vertically developed program, including trauma, eating disorders, and addiction. It's like they developed this place for you. And I will make all of this available to you starting right away if you're willing to do it.
Okay. Okay? Thank Fair you. Fair enough? Thank you. Okay. Coming up, we're going to meet a man who will stop at nothing to completely transform himself, but in a different way. He wants to look exactly like a Korean pop star. He has had 15 procedures and over $150,000 in plastic surgery to change the way he looks. We'll be right back. I've spent about $150,000 to perfect my image. My nose have actually had surgery five times. I've had so many procedures, like my whole face is numb, but I love it. It's such a great feeling. He shows it kind of more to his right. We see it on camera seven. Tomorrow on an all new Dr. Phil. My 10 year old son is very violent. I will kill you, I will murder you. I've never seen a little child overpower a grown adult. I will chop you till you die. That's tomorrow. Three, two, South Korean pop music or K-pop is taking the globe by storm with artists like BTS topping the charts. Now my guest, Ollie, says after a trip to Korea, he was inspired by the flashy colors and beautiful imagery and wanted to emulate it in his own music. And so with the help of plastic surgery, he tried to transform himself into a K-pop star. But his friends, Frenchie and Vicky, say that Ollie is now obsessed, undergoing multiple intensive surgeries back to back without time to recover. And this is a reckless pursuit of the perfect K-pop look. I'm doing everything I can to look like Jimin to have his skin, to have his facial structure, to have everything. My ultimate goal is to look like Jimin, my idol from BTS. I've spent about $150,000 to perfect my image. When you look at Jimin, you can just instantly fall in love. His lips just look so luscious and kissable. Just on my lips alone, I get them injected every three weeks. Over the years, my lips would be $20,000. I've had my jawbone completely shaved down. I have my chin bone shaved, cut off and reattached. I've got titanium screws and brackets to keep my chin in place. I had my eyes done, but now I want to change that to make my eyes more almond shaped, just like Jimin. I also have my cheekbone reduced. I've also been perfecting my nose. My nose have actually had surgery five times. I've had so many procedures, like my whole face is numb, but I love it, it's such a great feeling. My chin I can't even feel, I can just feel the metal inside my face. My cheeks I have no feeling at all, so when I smile it actually feels uncomfortable. So doing this, it's, it's, it's weird. If I'm like kissing my cardboard Jimin, or kissing one of my Jimin pillows, like I can't feel anything, it's terrible. I actually love being in recovery. I love lying in bed with bandages. I'm always at my happiest at that time. And then, then after about two months or something, that you know, great feeling of, wow, I love my new face kind of wears off, and then I'm always thinking about the next thing. If I have the eyebrow lift, it'll make my face very tight, so I won't have any expression, and I'll just look, you know, plastic fantastic. I need to change everything until I'm identical. Well, Ali has undergone 15 surgeries in six years and to change his looks. Now, something that he was bullied for growing up. When I was growing up as a teenager, I really struggled with the way I looked. I used to have very, very bad acne. I had such a big nose, my face was so round, it looked horrible. So when I would go to school, I would get teased, I would get bullied. Whenever I was dating someone, they would always cheat on me or reject me. And I always thought that was just the way I looked. So I thought, okay, I have to change that. Since I started having surgeries, I'm a totally different person. I used to be a shy, insecure boy next door. Such anxiety. Now I'm super confident. I can get on stage and sing my songs. I can perform. That's why I think plastic surgery can be a great thing because, you know, it can change your life. Okay, what is it that is so bad about you that you feel like you need to be somebody else and you have to know that the somebody else that you're wanting to be is not really who that person appears to be. That's a manufactured, marketed image. Mm. 
I mean, I've, I've been unhappy since I was a teenager. You know, I used to get teased at school. I used to get bullied. And I moved to Korea in 2013 and I fell in love with K-pop, fell in love with BTS. But it was Jimin in particular that became my absolute obsession. So I don't know. I've just never been happy with the way I looked. I was always insecure. So I thought, let me change myself. And now, you know, it's given me so much happiness. But I've, I've put myself through a lot of risks. And I do admit that. But you're wanting to be a um, clone or a replica of someone else, which is an insult to you. No, I think it's a tribute to Jimin, actually. You know, it's showing my appreciation for Jimin because I'm so in love with him. I'm so obsessed. So it's my appreciation for Jimin. So it's, I don't think it reflects badly. I'm not losing my, who I am. I'm still the same person underneath. Well, you, no, you're not. You're, uh, you're dressed like him. Right, He's right. wearing silver. You're yeah, wearing this silver. Is this similar. is the new look, right? This is my new look, the blonde hair, the plastic surgery. And I'm, I'm happy. Like, if you look at the pictures of me and Jimin, it's, we're identical. No, it's true. It's true. Uh, when I was in Korea, everyone calls me Jimin. When I'm walking down the street, everyone's like, oh, my God, it's Jimin. It's Jimin. Like, everyone, they think I'm Jimin. And I, I, know, I'm, I know I'm identical. Don't you want people to walk down the street and say, oh, that's Ollie. I love his music. No, I love it when they say Jimin. Like, trust me, it makes me feel so good because I know I've done a good job with the surgery. I know I've got the look perfected. When everyone calls me Jimin, I'm, I'm happy. Really? You're looking at me as if I'm crazy. I didn't say that, but <laughs> so you've, you've lied to doctors. I've had so many doctors that say no to me. So whenever someone says no, I just fly to a different country and find a doctor that says yes. Somebody was injecting right. your lips recently and you told them it had been months and it had been two weeks. Well, that was in Korea. You know, I was having the jaw surgery. I was having my chin shaved down, my cheeks, my nose. And they said, don't do any filler or Botox for months before. But I was like, I have to look good. I'm going to Korea. I'm doing a music video there. So I injected my lips literally two weeks before. And I did tell the doctor, it was like, oh, yeah, it's like, I think two, three months ago. So I did it anyway. So I had a reaction after the surgery. I had to get an emergency IV drip because the swelling was just, it was horrendous. My whole face was like just my lips. Okay. Well, I've got some questions and so do some of his friends. So we're going to take a break and uh, come back and I'm going to ask the questions that I really want to hear your answers to. We'll be right back. Ollie lied to me and he decided to do five surgery in one day. When we went to the consultation with the doctor, Oli lied to the plastic surgeon. I have wanted to look good. I know that, but you lied to him and then you had the complications. So on day five, his lips was swollen like 10 times bigger than mine. Tomorrow. My 10 year old son is very violent. I will kill you. He ripped that out of the banister on the stairs. You say that he really seems to have superhuman strength. I've never seen a little child overpower a grown adult. Do you have any doubt that he is going to seriously injure or kill someone in your family? Don't be me or his siblings. I will choke you till you die! That's tomorrow, then on Monday. Every day I was paddled or beaten. Inside a religious reform school. You weren't allowed to speak for 30 weeks. I was on sentence restriction. That's Monday. Before we get back to today's program, I want to let you know what we have coming up Thursday. I can't tell you how many exes I've had on this stage who have been at war over how their child should be raised. Co-parenting when divorced is a challenge for any adult, but the way these particular guests were behaving towards each other you would think they were the children. Take a look. My ex-wife, Jennifer, is a horrible one. Jennifer had multiple affairs throughout her marriage. Jennifer leaves her daughter home two or three times a week to go out to the bars with them. Ben is very much an ass. I just feel like he's like behind the scenes parent. He said I was nuts in front of my daughter. Well, trust me, there is a lot to unpack in this story. I'd go as far as to say that this show is a masterclass on how not to co-parent your child. So if you need some tips on that, you want to watch this show. It is an eye opener. You don't want to miss it. That's a week from today on Thursday. So let's get back to today's topic. So I was really struggling with my nose. So I ended up seeing the botch doctors. The silicone implant went to the side. Oh, right. So I had to get it done again in China and then again in Poland, and then again last year in Armenia. 
All the cartilage has been removed from your right Yeah. Now. There's nothing. So even if I wanted to, uh -huh. you can't make this smaller because there's no cartilage there. It's gone. Oh, my God. So you just got to leave it alone. Dr. Paul Nassif and Dr. Debro, they actually told me no, but I just went into the anyway in Korea. Well, Ali's best friend, Frenchie, is no stranger to surgery herself, but even she says that Ali is taking this to the extreme. I support plastic surgery. I think it's amazing when it's done the right way. But what I don't agree with is he wants to rush to do back to back to back to back surgery. So in May this year, I was in Korea with Oli, and it was already planned that he has his nose done for the fifth time. However, Oli lied to me, and he decided to do five surgery in one day. When we went to the consultation with the doctor, Oli lied to the plastic surgeon. Basically, as the doctor asked him, how long ago did you inject something in your lip? Because obviously they could see he had something in his lips, right? And he said, six months. And basically it was two weeks. I have wanted to look good. I know that, but you lied to him and then you had the complications. So on day five, his lips was swollen, like 10 times bigger than mine. I put myself at risk before. I could have died before. I can't help it. I have to do the surgery. If it's in my head, I have to do it. Oli is gambling with his health with his body and with his mind. And that's what scares me, because we all know plastic surgery can be fantastic, but it can also become a nightmare. OK, Frenchie, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dr. Fia. You actually believe he's putting himself at risk, right? Yes. Because it's, he's lying and putting himself in procedures that are medically contraindicated. He should not be doing them. Yeah, that's the issue. He's doing back to back to back. He did five surgeries in one day in Korea, which is extremely dangerous. Is he pretending to be confident or is he confident? I think he's happier now that he looks that way because he's, you know, he doesn't look exactly like Jimin, but he has that idol look. Have you no, ever met him? Not yet. I mean, I, I know it's going to happen at some stage. And if Jimin was watching this show, there's one thing I would want to say to him. I would literally, I've got a ring, I would literally say, Jimin, I want to marry you because I love you so much. Sarang hey, Jimin. That's what I'd say. I love him. That's I what you did say. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's in love with him. <laughs> oh, you know me, well, you're in love with him as well. No, like... I know, I'm obsessed with him as well. Oh, he's beautiful. Well, obsessed I, with me I've here. actually had people like you, I call them stalkers. Me? Um... <laughs> Stalker, that's not a very nice term. I call, I call myself a fan. Well, but... No, come on. Come on. I mean, you, this has gone beyond being a fan, right? Yeah, but I'm I mean, not like a dangerous trying... stalker. I'm just like a, a nice stalker. I'm just uh, a fan. Just a fan. You're just a nice stalker. No, I'm not, well, I'm not a stalker. I'm just like, I love him. How do you feel about Ollie? Well, the old Ollie, I feel, is dead. Like, the, the Ollie well, I, I used now. to know. Now, now I'm happy. Like, I'm a different person. I'm doing my K-pop music. I'm, I've got so much confidence. But uh, there's always more I want to do. Like, it's every time I have surgery, I'm always thinking about, OK, what am I going to do next? You know, I used to be in private practice. I'm not anymore. Uh, um, uh, that's a shame. Maybe I could come visit. No, no. Uh, but one of the things I did uh, when I was in private practice is I frequently would have colleagues, plastic surgeons, that would call and say, we'd like you to screen this patient to see if they're a good candidate for procedures and had they sent you to me to screen I, I would have said you would be a very high risk every time i have surgery there's always a psychologist on hand and they always have to assess me and i always lie to them i'm just be like oh no no i'm just doing it. i just want to do a little touch up and stuff so i always have to lie to them because if if i don't pass the test they're not going to do the surgery so i just have to so you lie to them and they go yeah. for it Ali is a controversial figure online, so what does he say about accusations of cultural appropriation in his music and his look? We'll talk about that next. Oli has a history of lying because Oli lied to his mom. His mom didn't know he did surgery until two months after, once everything was done. Oli lied to me when we were in Korea. He told me he will do just his nose, and then he ended up doing five procedures in one day. Then he lied to the doctor in Korea about his lips. I just want to make sure Oli is not going to lie to Dr. Phil, because how Dr. Phil is going to help him if he doesn't know the truth? Do you need Dr. Phil's help? Text PHIL to 88500 and share your story for a chance to appear on the show.
Standard message and data rates may apply. Season 18 is underway. All we need is you. If you're going to be in the Los Angeles area and want to watch a live taping, visit DrPhil.com and click Tickets. Tickets are free, and I hope to see you soon. You can't because I don't you. Thank you. Twenty-nine-year-old Lee has spent the last six years of his life completely transforming himself from who he describes as being a shy, bullied Oliver from the English countryside to confident K-pop artist Ali. But the physical transformation has been extreme. Ali even underwent five facial surgeries in one day. It's joining us via Skype is Ali's childhood friend, Vicky. What do you think about what he's doing to his body and his motive for doing what he's doing to his body? I'm really worried. Um, I think actually Ollie's got a lot of self-esteem issues. Um, I think he comes across quite confident on the show, but I think really deep down he's lacking self-esteem and actually lacking confidence in himself. He believes he has to be like Jimin to be successful and to be happy. And how, long have, how long have you known Ali? 13 years. I noticed that you were talking to two of my really good personal friends, Dr. Nassif and Dr. Dubrow. Mm -hmm. I heard them telling you, you don't want to be doing this. This is bad news. And I have tremendous respect for these two guys. And when I hear them tell you, you shouldn't be doing this, mm -hmm. Now, these are guys that do surgery, and when a surgeon tells you you shouldn't do surgery, then that's a pretty good indicator that you shouldn't do surgery. I know. Does but that concern you at all? Like when they told me that, I was shocked because they said my nose could fall off, I could get necrosis, I could get paralyzed in my jaw. So I was shocked, but after a couple of days, that shock wore off. And I thought, you know, let me, because Korea is the best in the world. So I just thought, let me go to Korea, sort it all out. They fixed my nose. I don't have any silicone. I've just got 24 titanium bracket, uh, titanium screws in my face. I've got eight metal brackets keeping my, my <clears> skull together. But apart from that, I've got no plastic in me. So I don't think anything's going to move. Titanium is pretty strong, Dr. Phil. So maybe I'm like Iron Man, Titanium Man or something. Titanium, yeah. Yeah. Hence the outfit. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll certainly agree you're hard-headed. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Now, you've been accused of cultural appropriation by fans of K-pop. Well, I get so much hate. Like, one of my music videos has 60,000 dislikes, but I really don't care. Like, at the end of the day, I'm not hurting people. What I'm doing is, you know, it's cultural appreciation. I'm not changing my race at all. I just appreciate Jimin's features and his looks. I happen to love Korea. I identify with the culture. I want to be Korean. Like, I want to be a Korean citizen. That's going to happen. I'm going to make it happen. But, like, it's, it's not to do with race. Like, everyone in Asia gets surgery to look more Western. They get higher nose bridge. They get uh, double eyelid surgery. I'm just doing the opposite. So what I'm doing is, you know, it's cultural appreciation. Well, you, you have a lot of uh, hate messages on there, but you mm. are number eight on the K-pop chart. Mm, I've had two singles that are number eight, and I've had a number 31 single as well. So, yeah. thank you. So, I mean, I do... I, I do give you that, um, but you know what really bothers me about this um, is I, I think underneath all of this, and because I don't respond to all of the image sort of stuff, I think beneath all of this, two things jump out at me. One is, I think beneath it all, you're a pretty nice guy. Thank you. A pretty decent guy. And... Secondly, I think you're really selling yourself short. You're not being your own best friend. I don't know. This, it just makes me happy. It's like a facade. Deep down, I I'm, I'm, I'm feel sad about myself. Like, I'm always trying to change myself, and I never feel good enough. You know, when I look in the mirror, I never feel beautiful. I never feel good, and I get so much hate online as well, and it just kind of adds to that feeling. So I just, it just makes me feel better about myself. Well, I've got a pivotal question for this young man right after the break. Well, I'm back with Ali, his good friend, Frenchie, his lifelong friend, Vicky, that's known him since the time in his life when he was being bullied. Do you realize that you've basically taken over for the bullies? 
But you they mean. quit and you took over for them. The bullies bullied you, then they went away, but you said, okay, bye, I got this, I'll bully Oliver, you leave, I'll take over. I'll continue to put him down, I'll continue to criticize him, I'll continue to criticize his looks, I'll continue all the things that you were doing, I'll do when you're gone. You've taken over for the bullies and you're continuing to kick your own ass. Yeah, I guess I'm my worst critic, like I do put myself down. Every time I look in the mirror, I see a fault. But I want you to really think about not abandoning yourself and who you are, because in the final analysis, it's you and you, buddy. I know. You can do all this other stuff, but in the final analysis, everywhere you go, Oliver goes with you. And you ought to make peace with him and learn to love that part of who you are. Well, that's why I love Jimin and BTS, because they're so positive and inspiring. So whenever I see Jimin, it just makes me happy. That's, it just, just makes me inspired. So that's why I do the surgery, because it's just something that makes me happy. So. Will you at least think about what I'm saying? Of course. All right, we're out of time. I want to thank all of my guests today. Uh, tune in to Botched on Mondays at 10 on E! and you'll see what my friends have to say. These guys are amazing docs. They get people out of a lot of messes. And a special thanks to Dr. Dina Mannion, Revive and Awakenings for offering to help Liz. We'll see you next time. Everybody here at Dr. Phil would like to congratulate our friends at Entertainment Tonight for celebrating their 10,000th show tomorrow. Such an amazing accomplishment. Congratulations, E.T. See you next time.